Greetings and welcome to part two of the introduction to how not to do business on the Homeless Consultant channel. My name is Paul B and I am the Homeless Consultant. In part two of this introduction, I'm going to give you some detail about the truck wash that I told you about in part one. This is the business that I'm using as a model for how not to do business. And in part one of the introduction, I told you how I came to be associated with this truck wash. Here I'm going to tell you about what the truck wash did, what it was supposed to do, and about all the red flags that were raised which ordinarily I would have recognized these red flags and uh, gotten out of that place. But because I was homeless, I was unable to leave this place, and I ended up eventually, as you're going to see in part three, where I talk about the owner, I ended up in a situation that, uh, relative to the United States of America in the 21st century, could only be called something along the lines of indentured servitude or slavery because I couldn't get away with my life. So let's look at what a truck wash actually does. There's two main services at this at this wash. One was washing the exteriors of trucks and when I say trucks I mean anything from a um, dual wheel pickup truck which we call a dually to um, the big rigs, the 18 wheelers with the 53 foot um, boxes, sometimes refrigerated behind them. So we would wash the exterior of these trucks on one side of the building and then on the other side of the building there was another bay that would fit the same size truck and we would do what's called a trailer washout. And that is where you know those 53 foot boxes they need to be washed out so that they're clean enough for the drivers to go pick up their next load. Those are the two main services for what it's worth. There were some smaller services that we would call, you know, upgrades or upcharges, such as engine washes. With these diesel engines, we can go in with power washes and directly wash them with the power wash, which you wouldn't want to do with your car. It'll tear your engine apart. Um, we had metal brightener. If you look at, start looking at big rigs as you watch this series, and you'll be interested to see how different they are, um, and yet the consistent parts from that all the trucks share. A lot of them had uh, these huge, you know, fuel tanks. Uh, many of them were made out of metal. The rims, just like on, you know, hot rod cars, they had a lot of metal rims and uh, battery boxes, things like that. We would have a, a metal brightener that we would apply to that. So that was another kind of a smaller service that we provided. Uh, Demudding, when we're dealing with uh, construction vehicles in particular, but also regular trucks that are just driving through muddy areas. Um, Demudding them, getting all of that mud off of there was quite a chore, and they were willing to pay for that. Likewise, debugging. Um, it's amazing. Some of these trucks would drive through, you know, Louisiana or the swamplands and things and come out with so many bugs. There was one truck that pulled into the truck wash, and as I approached and went around to their to the driver's side to ask them what service they wanted. I couldn't even see whether the driver was male or female or if they had a beard or not. That's how many bugs were on this person's windshield. So debugging was quite a service as well. And lastly, we kind of sort of did metal polishing, but it was more of an offer in this case. Again, this is how not to do business. It was more of an offer of doing metal polishing without ever really actually doing it. And the few times that they did it, I, I wasn't in on that. That was Jethro and this other fellow who came in for the summer. And um, they, to my knowledge, they only did actually two trucks, and they did some wheels for a third truck, I believe. They might have done three trucks. One of them they mangled, and, and it couldn't. It, the driver was too embarrassed about it to take it to a truck show that week, which is why he came in for the polishing in the first place. Um, you need to understand that truck drivers are professionals. Now they may not look like it. Some do, some don't. But they're professionals. Uh, a lot of times when they would get out of their trucks, while we wash them, they would go sit down at a table with essentially a briefcase and start filling out paperwork. They had to track what they were doing. They had to account for everything, whether they worked for 
uh, companies, if they were corporate drivers or if they were independents, they are professionals. And they have schedules to keep, they have paperwork to do, they have uh, taxes to pay, they have a lot of regulations, an increasing number of regulations, which is making life uh, very difficult for them. I'll talk about, I'll probably do a video called um, What I Learned About the Trucking Industry, just to kind of uh, impart to you everything that I learned over eight months. I can give you that in one video, and then you'll know some you know, basic details about the trucking industry. Uh, another thing about this truck wash is when I first came in there, when Mr. H hired me, there were a, several employees there at the time, although they weren't really, the only real full-time employee was Jethro. And Jethro had come in from the previous ownership of this truck wash, which means that he was part of a failed business. But he had been washing trucks for six years, so Mr. H gave him a lot of credibility and as we'll see throughout this series that credibility was quite misplaced there was a red flag right there when the person you hire in was trained by repeated repeatedly failing truck washes under different ownerships prior to Mr. H taking over there were also two um, young men from Puerto Rico and unfortunately in this case they were very lazy they did not like working they did not do a good job at all, um, but they knew how to work the system. They pretended not to speak English until it was payday, then all of a sudden they were fluent, that kind of thing. Um, shortly after I took over, they faded away. They were kind of on call to begin with. They faded away, um, not necessarily because they did a poor job, as you'll see. Uh, I think the greater reason is because they were, in fact, independent. They um, you're going to find that Mr. H liked to hire vulnerable people who he could really dominate and control. And if you can't say anything else about these two Puerto Rican guys, they, they, they were in control. <laughs> they knew how to work the system. They knew how to get around anything. Mr. H was not going to be able to dominate them. They were gone shortly thereafter. There was a, another uh, guy, I don't know how old he was, I think he was about 20-ish, plus or minus a year or two. And he also was very lazy, but he had a learning disability. Um, he was not what I would call a, a smart kid. He was nice. He was a nice guy. He, he really tried to be nice. And in that regard, I liked him. Um, but he was into drugs, in and out of jail, things like that. And that's what made him vulnerable, um, that Mr. H would hire him, because the job more or less kept him out of jail. Now, there were early red flags at this place, and again, I didn't necessarily recognize them as such at the time. I recognized them as red flags, but I had no idea how bad this place was. I, I couldn't have conceived of anybody being allowed to take over a business um, running things this poorly. So I'm just going to try to fly through because I have, I think I put, I don't, don't want to scroll to the bottom, but there's like 30 of them that I just kind of thought of. The first one I mentioned in the last video when I described how I came to work for this truck wash, Mr. H hired me on the spot without any background check. And per this is a tough one, this is a paradox. I personally do not like the concept of background checks, but it's mainly because of the potential danger there. But the fact is, they will tell you if someone was in jail, if they're on the, the sex offenders list, things like that. Um, he didn't run any check. He just hired me on the spot. Um, the only thing he knew about me was that I lived in a car and that I told him I had all this background in corporate experience. That's a red flag in terms of hiring. Now, in this case, it turned out great because it helped me a lot and I, I was telling the truth. I, I was what I said I was. And he got a great employee out of it. But in general, background checks, not doing one, is a bad way to hire, especially if you're opening a new business. Um, there was no W-4. Now, two weeks later at payday, he did, in fact, ask me for information, which he typed into the computer, but I never filled out a W-4 or signed my name to one. Likewise, he never asked for proof of my right to work in the United States. He never took my driver's license and um, you know, made a copy of it. He didn't even have a copier or a scanner. 
And this is my recollection. I leave open a 1% chance that maybe he took my ID and photographed it with his phone, which he should not do, his personal phone. But I, I do not recall him doing that, and I'm not aware that any other employee said that he had done that with them. Um, likewise, there was no orientation. So there was, Mr. H did not walk me around the building. He didn't even walk me around the building. And it wasn't a huge building. It had, you know, these two bays on either side, a hallway in the middle with the customer area, a small office, bathrooms, and the machinery room. And he didn't even walk me around and show me what these things did. He didn't tell me the history of this place, which I learned later, and it became very relevant. He didn't tell me some other things about um, the ownership of this building that I needed to know. We'll see that in a moment, or maybe in the next video. Likewise, there was no written job descriptions. There wasn't even a verbal job description. It was just washing trucks, whatever that meant. And I learned what that part meant early on. However, it turned out that there were some other things I was called upon to do that I did not know about. Now, this, in my case, wouldn't have stopped me from taking the job because I had to have it to survive, literally. I was out of money, out of income, stalled, out of gas. I couldn't go anywhere or do anything. I was going to just die. I was just going to starve or die from exposure in the winter in 21st century America. So I had to take the job. But... In most cases, someone going into a new job should be told, oh, you won't just be washing trucks. And f frankly, what that entails, you'll find out that the equipment we used to wash the trucks were, in many cases, quite dangerous. Um, I would be called upon to lift very heavy objects, these soap buckets, the 30-gallon soap buckets. I, I still don't know how much they weigh. They d the labeling didn't even tell you. I would estimate about 150 pounds. I'm not a big guy. I'm 49 years old. I've never been, I mean, I've been athletic, but I've never been a muscle man or a weightlifter. Um, Jethro was, in fact, a weightlifter, very strong. Um, but lifting these objects, um, that's a hernia waiting to happen, if not worse. Every time I'd move these buckets, they would, you know, I could just move them and roll them a couple inches, and they'd slam down, and they could slam on my feet, or they could jam my fingers between that bucket and one next to it quite dangerous. Um, skill sawing those thick plastic barrels when they got empty, Mr. H would have us just take a skill saw and just cut them up to throw them in the dumpster and it would shoot at high speed the, this plastic debris all over the place with no eye protection. Um, cleaning sewer drains. And these sewers were filthy. I mean they were basically the drains from the truck wash but given what went into them from what we washed out of the trucks they were basically sewers. They smelled like sewers, and I had to spend a lot of time uh, dealing with those. And let's uh, let's just be honest with it. You know, this is not something anyone would put in a job description, but this is what a lot of the job ended up entailing. It ended up being employees just servicing the owner's ego. He he had a great need to talk, 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 and tell you how the world is tell you what's wrong with the United States, why Protestants are, are ruining the world. He, and you had to sit there and take it on the clock, or in my case, off the clock. That was a big part of the job. It was a big, a lot of the time that I spent there was spent just listening to this guy talk. It was servicing his ego. There were no written procedures or unwritten procedures. So when it came to how to wash these trucks, it was just grab a wand and do it. Um, my training involved Jethro basically showing me what to do lightly. He didn't give me any details. You know, you lay down soap first, then you lay down the other soap, and then you rinse it, and then you hit the power rinse and you leave the room so you don't get wet. And that's basically what he told me to do. But again, look at these big rigs. There's a lot on those things. There's all kinds of curves and places where diesel fuel leaks and if they have a hydraulic leak it'll spray all over this. They have refrigerators. Um, there were no procedures, not just written, but nobody there had a consistent idea of how to wash a truck until I came along and I, I kind of developed my own. There was no coherent scheduling or breaks or lunch. Now that meant if we got really busy, I could go an entire day without a break or a lunch. Just work eight hours straight. 
lucky if I was able to go to the bathroom. You would think that violates a labor law somewhere in a, in a country that cares anything about employees. Um, that's a red flag. Something's wrong with the scheduling. Something's wrong with the way this place is running when employees can work eight hours or more. I worked one Saturday all by myself. I believe it was nine and a half hours and I didn't get a break or a lunch. And yes, I was exhausted. And can you guess what happened when it was all over? I got to sit to listen to Mr. H talk. Um, I mentioned a moment ago there was no training as such. They just had Jethro. This, and I like Jethro. I do. I do like Jethro personally. But the fact is, um, he's not a good employee. He does not like working. He will work once he starts working. He'll he'll go at it. But he didn't do a good job washing trucks. He had worked for a failed truck wash previous under the previous ownership he really had no business training me he didn't even know how to do it himself but that was all the training I got and as I probably said somewhere else by the end of the first day or the second day I was already washing trucks better than anyone else there and it remained that way for the duration of my time there for eight months and it's just because I cared enough I, I looked at the trucks and I said well if this was my truck what would I want it to look like based on how much they were paying which was a lot of money the hours were incoherent. That's a big, big red flag. Posted on the door, it said 9 to 5. That was our official hours. But what happened was, Jethro would come in at random times. He would open up at 7, 7.15, 8 o'clock, 8.30, just whenever he felt like getting there. Not only that, but he might arrive at 7, punch in on the clock, and not actually open the doors until, you know, 7.30 or 8, 8.30, even if there's trucks waiting outside. And you'll find out that there would be trucks waiting outside. And one reason is because we didn't open at 9. That was our official time posted on the door, but they would keep opening at whatever random hour they felt like it beforehand. And that trained these drivers to come in, and then, of course, the drivers got used to it. And if you did not open at 7.30 or 8, and you did open at 9 when you said you would, the drivers would get upset and yell at you, I've been sitting out here for two hours, you didn't open up. And likewise, the hours um, closing were not necessarily 5 o'clock. That one's not so bad um, for other reasons. You know, we can, it can actually be a customer service benefit, but opening was totally inconsistent. Um, another big red flag is that Jethro, and I, I mentioned a moment ago he didn't like working, Jethro turned away a lot of business. He turned away trucks. He would shut the, he would come in and keep the door shut and just play Pokemon Go on his phone while there's drivers out there. Um, he turned drivers away often, especially if it was anywhere near 5 o'clock, even 4.30 he would turn away trucks and tell them, you know, there's no way we'll get you done by five, you, you gotta go. And the, the number of ways he turned away trucks, he was rude to the drivers, he, he, all kinds of ways he turned away business. And I ended up um, adding up how much business he was turning away over a period of about three months. And when I extrapolated that over a full year, I estimated that he had turned, he, over a course of a year, Jethro alone, one employee, the, the, the person who Mr. H considered the manager, even though he didn't have that title or pay or responsibilities, but he would call Jethro the manager because he had experience in a truck wash. My estimate was that in the course of one year, Jethro would turn away about $30,000 in revenue. And it's not like I didn't bring this up to Mr. H, but Mr. H didn't care. So the number of red flags on that one alone, you know, that's actually the corollary I have here to this, is that the owner didn't care when I told him about what Jethro was doing turning away business. That is how not to run a business. How can you own a business, your own pride and joy, your business, and learn that you're your so-called main employee with all the experience is turning away business left and right to, to that degree and you don't do anything about it you don't even seem to care that's how not to do business um, up to four people could you there was just one cash drawer one 
point-of-sale computer. Up to four people could use that cash drawer throughout a day. There was no identification of who was um, registering a given receipt. We had no employee ID numbers. We had nothing to identify who was ringing up a given receipt. And you could have up to four people on that cash drawer. The cash drawer was constantly in chaos. It never balanced right. Uh, we started out with it at $150 and ended up, when I left, it was up to $200 officially, but the drawer could get down to $50 with no accounting for the other $150. And you'll find that I, I took some steps to try to um, deal with that. For example, I, I created these vouchers so that whenever money was taken out of the drawer, you put a voucher in there to account for where that money is. For example, if I went to the bank to get change, I would put a voucher for the amount of money I took in the drawer. So at any given moment, if we were audited, at least there would be some accounting for what's going on with the money. I also created a reconciliation form for the... Um, for the cash drawer so when we did the Z tape at the end of the day which was usually almost always me doing that um, thank goodness <laughs> and um, I would you know be able to reconcile count up what's in the drawer and with the vouchers and such try to reconcile it but the problem is it never balanced ever it was always wrong and when you see the reasons for it you're gonna be shocked um, for example, I'll, I'll let this cat out of the bag. Jethro once took $100 out of the drawer for, because he needed $100, and he just left a sticky note in there saying, I had to borrow $100, sorry. That's on a $200 drawer. Mr. H had nothing to say about it. By the time I'd left, Jethro still had not paid back that full $100. This is how not to do business. Red flags everywhere. The pricing was inherited from the previous ownership, the previous failed ownership of this truck wash. Mr. H had taken no apparent interest in some kind of rational, coherent um, pricing structure, looking into it, looking into competition, looking into the costs of supplies and um, payroll and things like that, and coming up with prices that made any rational sense. And even then, Mr. H himself would misquote prices all the time. He just pull things off the top of his head, which made our pricing absolute chaos. I mean, one driver gets a service for fifty dollars, and the next one comes in, and we tell him it's ninety-five. Well, how do you do business that way? Red flags. Um, in terms of safety, MSDS sheets were inherited from the previous ownership. There were only a couple of them, maybe six or seven, eight. MSDS sheets for all those chemicals we had there. They were all wadded up. They weren't even punched and put into the binder, this MSDS binder. They were just shoved in there and they'd been all folded up. So if you had an emergency and you had to look at these MSDS sheets, first of all, the odds are the chemical in question wasn't there. Second, if it was there, you had to flatten them all out somehow and try to flip them over while they're wadding up. Mr. H did nothing to maintain those or to acquire new MSDS sheets for all the new chemicals that he brought in. Likewise, there was no HMIS labeling at all. Um, everything in this place was totally disorganized. It was, it was just a junkyard. Remember Sanford and Son? wasn't quite that bad, but in some areas of the building, it actually was that bad. It just looked like a junkyard. And when we did what Mr. H would call cleaning, moving things around, which was usually in response to his need to access a certain area, all we did was, after all that work, was produce another junkyard with a new configuration of junk. This is how not to run a business. The exterior was a wreck. It was a complete wreck. There were weeds growing tall everywhere. The potholes here... Um, with big rigs, these are pot, These are real potholes. These are six, eight, ten inch deep potholes. Huge. One of the reasons the suspension on my car is, is now fried. I need about a thousand dollars just to get my um, suspension where it's safe. Um, you'll see in another video where the wheel fell off my car. One of the reasons for that is because I was driving over these potholes that just BAM! Just absolutely bottomed out my car. You know, maybe in a big rig you don't feel it as much, but in a car you do, and that's where I worked. And as you'll, you know, see, that's where I slept. Um, just without any doubt, there's not even any, there, there's no comparison. This is the most dangerous workplace I've ever been in. 
and the safety hazards were abundant and they were not dealt with. Nobody even cared about them except me. Um, the solutions to all problems were basically duct tape or some variety of that. It was just how can we fix it now? Just get it working for now while I go on to something else. And of course it'll blow up again later, but at least now it's fixed. And you've seen people who do that kind of maintenance. No way to run a business. Um, in the customer area, which was that long hallway in the customer area, the office area, there was no decor at all. It was just drab and depressing. It was like a bunker. The paint was old. It was uh, discolored. It was multicolored. The windows were so bad you could hardly see through these huge windows into the bays where the drivers would want to watch us washing. The only thing you could call decor in there were two things. One, and they both came from Mr. H. One was one of those Catholic things with the water that you dip your fingers in for the holy water. I'm not sure what they're called. And the other was a Keurig coffee machine, which apparently cost a lot of money, but it never worked. And not only did it not work, but the error it kept giving drivers when they tried to make a cup of coffee was check water supply. We're a truck wash. We deal with water more than any other, you know, supply. And yet, our own coffee maker didn't work most of the time because there's something wrong with the water supply. And that's pretty analogous to the way that our washing system worked as well. There was just always something wrong with it. And Mr. H, his focus was so poor and he was so obsessed with the automated machine that didn't work that all these other things just were never repaired. There were, again, there were daily technical problems here, um, kind of like whack-a-mole, you know, you smack a, a mole here and beep, pops up there and bam, you hit it. So one day the soap isn't coming out of the power washer and I can't wash trucks because of that. So it, Mr. H comes in and fixes that. The next day the water pressure is so high that when I squeeze the trigger it literally recoils like a musket and it throws my shoulder out of joint. Um, then uh, we had the, 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 the power washer handles it wouldn't turn off so it's just dumping soap all over so right in front of the customers I have to be humiliated sitting there just flapping this this handle you know maybe as many as 50 times or more before it would finally shut off it's just embarrassing and a total waste of soap um, just everything was in a state of disrepair and they never got fixed permanently it was always this duct tape solution um, contractors excuse me, contractors would show up unannounced. So electricians or painters or HVAC people, they would just show up unannounced because Mr. H never bothered to tell us they were coming. Or, as you'll see later, in some cases Mr. H didn't know they were coming because there were other um, hidden people who had a little more control there than Mr. H ever let on. But that makes it difficult for us when someone comes in and says, uh, I need to shut down your bay or I need access to this, that, and the other thing. We didn't even know they were coming. And if we were really busy, we did not have time to deal with contractors. There's no excuse for contractors showing up when we can't really allow them to do their work. That's total lack of communication. I mean, I mean, I mean total lack of communication. For example, when the painters showed up to wash or, or to paint our wash bay, which ended up becoming a five-week ordeal. We, ju we were just up in the morning, we opened, we started washing trucks, and this painter just showed up and said, I'm here to paint your bay. That entails shutting down the whole bay, the most profitable side of the business, for five weeks, and nobody told us about it. This is the kind of thing we had to deal with, red flags, how not to do business. There was no proactive monitoring of supplies, so we ran out all the time. Mr. H would order it after we ran out of it, and that meant we didn't have what we needed to do the job. And sometimes that led to rather unethical, well, totally, what am I saying? Totally unethical acts to cover up our tracks on that, which I despised. And I, again, these are things that normally would have me leaving the business in a heartbeat. I don't want to be associated with that. But I'm homeless. I live in a car. It was my only way to survive. Um, drivers expected all kinds of hours and prices and services because everything was so inconsistent. I've already told you how the people who worked at the truck wash while I was there, you know, the owner would just shout out a price off the top of his head. He, di he didn't even know his own prices, so he'd just make up what he thought was correct. 
all the information on the web from previous owners was still there. So a lot of these owners, or a lot of these drivers had bad information. A big red flag. There was no consistency, and the, anything that we did set down as hours or prices were not filtering out there into the world. There was no policy for dealing with standard scams. And in most business, you have, you know, issues with, you know, uh, shoplifting or scams and things. And I'm always reminded of, if you remember, the Great White North, SCTV, and they had that skit with Bob and Doug McKenzie, and they said, well, hey, hey, you, here, here's how you get a free case of beer. You, you empty out the bottle, you drink the bottle, then you take a baby mouse, you put the baby mouse in the bottle, and you feed it, and it grows too big to get out of the bottle. Then you pour in beer and put a cap on it and take it to the brewery. They're going to give you a free case of beer. And, and it sounds ridiculous, but that's how obvious the scams were that we would get from drivers. They were standard scams. And the idea of us falling for it or not having a policy in place such that we were taken to the cleaners by it over and over and over again, absolutely inexcusable. These are standard scams in the, in the trucking industry. They're just inexcusable that we would lose money or that I would spend an hour washing someone's truck, getting dirt and filth in my mouth and my eyes and my ears and soaking wet, just exhausted, you know, have my arms up in the air with these power washers for an hour and the driver just sits there and watches it and they know they're going to scam me the whole time and when it's done, instead of paying me what I just earned by working for a living, this driver wants it for free and they pull a scam. We had no policy in place to deal with it. That's a big red flag. We had trucks parking in our parking lot every single night. And I'll, I'll probably go over that more in detail somewhere else because there's a lot more to that. But that's what created a lot of the potholes. It blocked access to our business. It blocked access to visibility of our business. And as you'll see, a lot of drivers didn't even know we were there. And since there wasn't really any signage, um, block, having these trucks just parking there to sleep at night um, it blocked visibility of the building so it cost us business but there's other things drivers not all but some drivers do bring in um, prostitutes things possibly drugs things like that and that be that creates liability issues and a whole lot of other issues and um, nothing was effectively done about it the only one who showed any sincere concern about it was me and I showed that concern the whole time I was there this is a big one. This is a huge red flag. My very first paycheck was late. And it wasn't just one day late, it was two days late. And when I asked the other employees, how is this possible? How could, he, how could he possibly pay us late? They said, oh geez, that happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. And as it turns out, over time I found out that at least 50% of the time our paychecks were late without any good reason except that Mr. H got distracted because he had no ability to focus and he, he didn't fulfill his responsibility as the owner. He didn't have many responsibilities there in terms of daily operations. You know, accounts payable, accounts receivable, things like that, but payroll is a huge one. And he failed, I have, I have never, not only have I not seen anyone fail so miserably in their responsibility but I can't conceive of how anyone could get away with this. We were paid late almost all the time, and if we weren't, we were terrified that we would be. We never knew until the check actually showed up in the bank. Now on this first one, because I was out of money and this was my first paycheck, you know, getting trying to get back on my feet, um, I had sent out my car insurance check on Tuesday, knowing that it would arrive there on Thursday. I was supposed to be paid on Wednesday should have been plenty of time but as it happens the check did arrive on Thursday which is the day after payday but they cashed that check right away and I didn't get paid till Friday so I ended up with the first overdraft in my life in my life I am very responsible at taking care of money even when I'm living on fumes in college and things like that it, the poorest I've been I've never written a bad check ever and frankly this wasn't a bad check um, I don't like the idea of writing a check when the money isn't already there, period. This was the one time I really had to do it because it was the first check I'd received in, you know, well over a year. And I wanted to get my car insurance in on time. And Mr. H, he never comprehended the impact that that had on other people. 
receiving their paychecks late. Not only that, but he screwed up a lot of the paychecks, put the wrong amount in there. And if that were ever audited, I, I can't imagine. I, I just I pity the auditor who would have to try to make sense out of this. He didn't know what he was doing, and he didn't he didn't have a commitment to fulfilling his responsibility in the first place. And you put those two together and payroll becomes a source of pain as much as a source of pleasure for us. Um, and, you know, that brings me to the next item on my list. Generally, the owner, Mr. H, he just had an incredible difficulty comprehending the obvious. Things that any reasonable or rational person should be able to figure out easily, especially if they're told by someone else, Mr. H couldn't grasp it. And that's a huge red flag because nominally throughout the, the time I was there, there were only two employees. There was myself and Jethro. And then Mr. H, who had other ventures going on around town, so he was not there all the time. He would show up at really bizarre times. And usually, instead of doing anything productive, he would just interfere with our ability to do our jobs. Because Jethro and I could run this place. Um, for example, um, for painting, when we had to take down these huge, heavy metal shelves. And these shelves are holding those 150, well, they weren't holding those, they were underneath. But they were holding very, very heavy items. These, these are steel shelves. And Mr. H had us bring all the barrels, all the soap barrels, into the customer area. All these chemicals that he didn't have MSDS sheets for. Bring them into the customer area, cover them up with plastic. Just looked ridiculous. Looked like a junkyard. Looked like we didn't care. And then he told us to put all the steel from these shelves on top of the buckets. Well, we need to access those buckets. That's the soap that we use to run the truck wash. And he delivered those soaps to other car washes and such. That was another one of his uh, ventures. So, you know, I said right out of the gate, we shouldn't put the steel on these buckets. You're going to need to get in there in a day or two. But he didn't care. He had us put it on the buckets. And guess what? A day or two later, he calls up, up on the phone, you're going to have to move all that steel off those buckets. I've got to get some soap out of there. This is the kind of thing that went on all the time. You could not tell Mr. H things that just plain made rational sense. He didn't get it. If it came from another person in particular, he didn't want to hear it. He didn't respect other people. He, he really thought he knew everything. But we'll talk about Mr. H in the next video more. Um, as time went on, the red flags began to get really weird. Um, I just told you a little bit about Mr. H's personality, but ultimately he was a very, very odd, different person. Um, he had no focus at all. You know, call it attention deficit disorder all you want to. I don't think that's the case. He just refused to focus. I mean, if you went with attention deficit, the, the diagnostic criteria for that, then when I was in school, I would have been diagnosed with it, and they would have pumped me full of Ritalin. And in fact, I, I, more or less, that's what they did. They called it hyperactive back then. And, I, you know, bless my mother's heart, she said, there's no way I was going to let them put this Ritalin in you. And thank goodness for it, because you know what? In the end, in the end, later in life and business and, and such, and with my personal projects, I became famous for my ability to focus. There's no attention deficit there. It was, it was just a rambunctious kid, just a hyperactive kid. Mr. H is very hyperactive, but I have the ability to focus when I want to. He refuses to do it. He could. Well, he'll focus, for example, on his obsessions like this machine, but he won't focus on other things. And you can't run a business that way. He was a motor mouth, just blah, 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 blah. He would not stop talking. And it was monologues. It was diatribes. And we would have to sit there and listen to it. As I said before, Servicing his ego was a big part of this job. Nobody told me that when I started there. Um, likewise, he was a know-it-all. He knew everything. And, in fact, he's one of those walking trivial pursuit boards who would, um, you know, basically learn a little bit about everything so that no matter what conversation started, he could inject himself into the conversation with some trivia and then just take it over. And then everyone else just sits around and, and stares at him and listens to him talk. And you know these kinds of people. This makes it very, very difficult 
for me to be there. I'm trying to do work. I'm trying to get a business running successfully. And if we have any kind of a break, I want it to be a break. I want it to be something that I can benefit from. I don't want it to be consumed by listening to this guy shooting his mouth off all the time. But that's all he did. He just talked and talked and talked. Um, yeah, he, he big old smile, you know, hyper friendly, but in that kind of creepy way. Because the fact is, as you dealt with him over time, he was arrogant. He was insulting. He would humiliate people. And he, he was just downright abusive always with that smile and I'm not going to get into psychology here or things like that this actually is kind of a characteristic of the dominant culture in Minnesota this smile with the knife behind their back this is a Minnesota thing I have not seen anywhere else in the country but Mr. H um, epitomized that he, he was basically out of touch with reality and you could not bring him into that realm he had his own idea of how the world worked and what needed to be done, and that, that's a walking failure. I mean, you're, you're going to fail when you can't get yourself in touch with reality. Um, and to be honest, watching him operate this business was like watching the Three Stooges. And it sounds like hyperbole or some kind of exaggeration or an insult. It's not. It was like watching the Three Stooges. If, if I had been totally detached and I had no skin in that game and my paycheck was not dependent on it, my life was not dependent on it, I probably would have found it really funny. Because it, it's just ludicrous. It's like, you know, Faulty Towers if you're into British comedy. Um, it was just a madhouse. The way he would run from the, he'd go back and forth and start this and then start that and never finish that and never, and, and, and then when he leaves at the end of the day, everything's just in chaos. And he felt like he had done a great day's work. He was just a madhouse. Now, he went to business school, but he had no idea how to run a business, or at least he had no idea how to run this truck wash. What you're going to find through all these videos is that the only person there, and th it turns out there's people above Mr. H, who I wasn't told about, um, very wealthy people. And yet, the only people involved in this whole business who had the foggiest idea how to run this business in any meaningful way was the guy you're seeing living in a car. And that's one of the points of these videos, is to drive that point home. That it's inexcusable that I'm homeless. And all these other people are doing just fine when they don't know what they're doing. They don't even try. For all this um, tendency toward failure, Mr. H was just hyper-confident and arrogant. He, he knew everything. And that creates a, a conflict when you're constantly butting heads with something like that. You just want to run away. And it drove everyone crazy. It drove contractors crazy. It drove me crazy. It even drove Jethro crazy. And he was just kind of a laid-back, you know, self-described redneck type. Um, even he was hitting the walls at the end. And uh, drivers, drivers could not stand Mr. H. They just, they didn't even want to be there when he was there. Um, but he'd never get it. Mr. H brought his children into work. His children were about roughly 10 years old, 12 years old, and 16 years old. The 16-year-old had a serious learning disability. Really sweet kid, no doubt about it. Not his fault, but he had a serious learning disability, and that's the way it is. Mr. H did not, Mr. H talked about it all the time. He'd say, you know, well, my son has a learning disability, and he'd say that all the time. It really irked me. You know, I mean, if his kid heard that, you know, what a terrible way to describe your child. But he was right. He did have a serious learning disability. He had no business being around this kind of industrial environment. The kids would come in and they would um, surf around on our point of sale computer, the one that we used to generate receipts for customers, take in cash. They would come in and surf the net and play video games on that. Um, the youngest kid once got in our cash drawer and looked through all the coins looking for all what he considered old coins and he put them in a special area with a sticky note on it saying please don't touch these are old coins and by the way those coins were from about the year I was born so I hope they're not that old um, now granted I did the same thing when I was a kid I thought coins from the 1940s were old when I was a kid and I would take them out but I didn't go take them out of a cash drawer and set them aside with a sticky note. And, of course, after he did that, 
never touched it again. So we just had a sticky note covering up a bunch of coins in our cash drawer for a month or two before somebody finally got some sense and put them back where they belonged. Um, the, the one with the learning disability, he would get on the computer and he'd put a new background on the computer all the time. One time he put a porno of Homer Simpson on there. Now, I don't think he knew what he was seeing, and the customers didn't see it because we had our software up before it, but when I, when I was leaving at the end of the day, and I, I, I was just pretty shocked at what I saw there, and I went and changed the background. They had a Skyjack there. It's a pneumatic lift. The thing goes up, I don't know how high, maybe 30, possibly 40 feet, maybe more. I, I, it went all the way up to the roof. It went all the way up to the top of these bays. It, it went up a really, really high. Now, given the way that Mr. H did not do maintenance on anything properly, that thing scared me to death because if he wasn't doing maintenance on that, there's no telling what could happen. The Skyjack was easily capable of cutting a human head off if you stuck it in the accordion easily. Hands, no problem. It could probably cut a buffalo's head off. But all three of these kids would just run and treat that thing as a skateboard. Just beep, 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 beep. They'd just drive that thing all over the place. One time, the 16-year-old, the, the one with the learning disability, Mr. H brought him in. Then he went to the store to get some supplies, leaving him alone. I'm washing trucks. I was doing a trailer washout. And I look out behind, and the 16-year-old with the disability had taken the Skyjack out into the road off our property into the road of the truck stop where these semis drive through and he'd raised it up all the way and he's just sitting up there just looking around having a great old time and I, I had to deal with this all the time watching these kids be endangered and Mr. H thought that he was teaching these kids some kind of a lesson about life the kids would mow the lawn and the, because these kids were really rambunctious, one time one, the, the middle kid, the middle about 12 years old, was out mowing the lawn and he's being really reckless with it. One of the truck drivers from over at the truck stop actually walked over and Mr. H's wife was here at the time and she bawled out Mr. H and the wife for being irresponsible and letting this kid be out there. He could have easily cut his foot off or something. Now, under that scrutiny and pressure, all of a sudden, they were like, oh, no, this is terrible. And they went out, and they immediately told him to stop and all that. But from that point on, the kids were still out there mowing the lawn. And I had to watch this go on and on, and just waiting for a kid to get hurt. Well, here's a case. The kid did get hurt. The youngest one, who was 9 or 10 years old, Mr. H had them doing work, not on payroll, but work at the truck wash. He had them out there wa doing trailer washouts with these power washers. They're called power washers for a reason. And there's a certain tip you can put on these power washers that focuses the water like a laser beam. It becomes extremely powerful. It doesn't disperse it, you know, outward. It brings it in to a point. Well, this 9-year-old or 10-year-old was spraying in there, and he sprayed it on his foot, and it put a hole right through, basically right through his foot. It, it broke open the skin in a big hole. We had to go through his shoe and everything. And the kid starts screaming. Now, they took him to the doctor, and the kid ended up getting a staph infection in there. And when all that was healed, a couple months later, can you guess what Mr. H did? He had the kid up there washing trucks again. And I had to just sit there and watch this. Those kids would play around behind the trucks as we're washing them out. A power washer. A lot of the things in these trucks were nails because they have pallets in them and the pallets get broken up by forklifts. So, uh, there was one truck I had a whole cup filled with you know, rusty nails. And when we're blowing them, we're blowing them out of the truck. They come out at high speed. You don't want anybody standing behind the end of those things. Those kids would just go out there and play. Or they would think they're helping us by sweeping things out of the way which we didn't want done for another reason, but these, these kids had no business being there. They had no business being put in harm's way as often as they were. Um, they were literally riding skateboards throughout the bays, and one time they left the skateboard in the hallway, and as you're going to see in a moment, for, for a particular reason, the hallway would often go dark. 
So some of these drivers, you know, with all due respect, some of these drivers can't even see their own feet. They're very large. But either way, someone walking into a business and down a hallway, they're not going to expect in the shadow in some dark area for there to be a skateboard sitting there. They would treat the office chair like a skateboard. Just get on it and ride it down and up and down the hall. They, they rode it into that sewer water when the, when the bay flooded one time. Treated it like a boat. They left it in the machinery room. The, the kids were just out of control. And yet Mr. H thought that, they, that this was all well and good. That he was teaching them how to you know, be responsible, hard-working business people. He was teaching them how not to do business. He never taught them how to do accounts payable or receivable. He didn't even know how to do it properly. He was teaching them how to have no focus, how to come into a business and just run it like a circus. That's what he was teaching his kids. Um, once the kids, one of the worst things we had to wash out of trailers were potatoes, especially sweet potatoes. They get slammed because the, the trailers have these big ridges, you know, like one inch high ridges. And the potatoes would just get smashed in there and they're really hard to get out so you would use that that zero point tip I talked about like the laser beam and it would basically disintegrate the potato just splatter it so when you're done with a potato truck you end up with all these full-sized and splattered potatoes on the floor and then you have to clean them up well I was doing that one time and the kids went out there and they took a power washer wand used it as a baseball bat and the other one threw potatoes and they would hit it and it would smash the potato, just splatter it. So that's organic matter being splashed all over the bay. It got up in the shelves, places that there's no effective way to clean. All the stuff we had stored in there was just covered with potato splatter. This is organic matter that rots and attracts really nasty creatures and critters. And I actually told Mr. H about this. I was walking along and I try not to say anything about his kids because he's very defensive when it comes to his kids. But I, I pointed out, you see what they're doing in there? This is spraying potato splatter all over the stuff. Someone's going to have to clean all that up. And all he said was, kids will be kids. And he didn't stop them. I had to clean that up, by the way. Um, and again, this is typical for Minnesota parenting when you get into that, that kind of subculture that dominates this place with the, the big smile and the knife behind your back. Um, unfortunately, that's pretty typical for Minnesota parenting, but the kids were in harm's way, and I did not like being around that all the time. I did not like seeing it. They, the kids deserve better than that, and I didn't want to see the disasters happen like when that kid got hurt. Um, you know, and just to contrast this one, when I was young, my father was a banker, so, you know, he wore a suit and a shirt and tie, and he sat in, an off in a desk in an office in a bank. And this is back before, you know, the United States went insane. So it was still pretty typical, you know, in the 70s, just straight up 50s kind of, you know, people with black glasses and greased hair and all that. And I would go visit him at work and, you know, I would ride my bicycle down there and visit him. And everyone loved to see me and... Um, but I knew how to behave myself. I did not make a menace of myself. And in fact, you know, I would learn some things about how the bank operated there, and I didn't stay long, and then I left. But my father did take me to things like Rotary meetings and Lions Club meetings, things like that. And through it all, he never taught me banking as such. He wished he hadn't become a banker, to be honest. But, um, you know, I, I learned about his sense of responsibility, and I learned what he was doing to bring us that food and, you know, the, the nice house that we had and things like that. I learned what he was doing, and he was being very responsible. There was nothing like Mr. H with this total lack of focus and running around like a chicken with your head cut off, never having a plan and following it through, um, which is what his kids are learning right in front of my eyes. It was just very difficult for me to see that. Now... Also related to his family, his father and his mother would show up pretty much daily. His father was very old, I'd say around 80, and he looked it, and he, he was pretty sharp for his age, but um, he would take the deposit envelopes and take them to the bank. But he was also very lonely, he was retired, and he was looking for some sense of purpose. Again, that's not my job. I wasn't on the payroll to, to babysit an 80-year-old man. The wife, the mother, Mr. H's mother, 
had very advanced Alzheimer's disease. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that when that skateboard was on the floor in the hallway, the lights got turned off somehow. Well, one, Mr. H's mother would pace the floor back and forth down this hallway, and every time she got to the end, she'd flip the lights on and flip them off, flip them on, flip them off. This is an industrial environment, basically, even if the skateboard wasn't there. And no one did anything about it. She could do that for hours because Mr. H's father would stay there for hours. He was looking for something to do with his life, and all he did was get in the way. He just got in the way. He asked questions that didn't matter if we answered them or not because it wasn't really any of his concern. He interfered. He just blatantly interfered with the running of the business. The mother, because of this advanced Alzheimer's, she could go from maniacal laughter, just <laughs> to you're not special. Things like that. Now, which driver, which driver is in his truck or her truck driving cross country? They're tired. They get out and they stretch at a truck wash. They need to get it washed. They walk outside and often the father would leave the mother sitting in the car like I am here with the window cracked, which you wouldn't even do with a dog. And she would get in like I can't even do it. If you ever saw, I, she reminded me of Bill the Cat in the old Bloom Carney, County cartoons. You know, ah, pfft, that Bill the Cat, and he just sit there like, like he's a corpse. And let me make this perfectly clear: I am not insensitive to what Alzheimer's is. My father died of Alzheimer's. I understand. The point is that this is a business. So why is a woman who goes around calling people evil or going to maniacal laughter, turning off lights, um, she's in harm's way as much as anyone else, and often left just looking literally like a corpse. You could just see the, the veins and the bones through her body. So if you're a driver and you get out of your truck and you go to the door and right next to the door is a car with what looks like a human corpse sitting in the front, just, just looking like it's dead. And then you walk inside and you get accosted by an 80-year-old man who ju whose only purpose is he's bored and lonely. So he starts trying to act like he belongs there and he knows what he's doing. And he usually screwed everything up. And if you make it past all that, then you've got these kids running around. And this didn't always happen. I'm not saying the kids were always there. That's not the case. Although through the summer they were there often. But this is what drivers would see. And then they finally get in and they talk to Mr. H because we are out actually washing the trucks. And Mr. H talks their head off and quotes them wrong prices, just does everything wrong. Now, this is how not to run a business. You see, this is not a family-run business. The kids were not on the payroll. They weren't old enough to be. The father was not on the payroll that I'm aware of. The mother certainly wasn't. The wife wasn't. It was a business that was run and owned by a man who was a head of a family. That's different than a family-run business. There was nothing charming or quaint about this, no matter what Mr. H might have thought. It was a nuisance. It made us look like a bunch of buffoons. It was just totally disorganized, and there was so much danger there that I just cringed all the time. Now... Another thing that happened that started to get into the weird realm, there were these guys who would occasionally drive these big, huge, expensive pickup trucks really slowly right through our bay, like through the washout bay. And they'd just kind of look over at us through the window. I was like, what is that about? And then they'd go outside, they'd drive around in circles slowly in the parking lot, maybe sit there for a while, and then they'd leave. It was really creepy. Okay, But then it got creepier because... At one point, one of these guys in this trucks, he walked into the building and he walked straight into the door that said no admittance, employees only. So I, I walk over to check out what this is all about and then he starts asking me really detailed questions about the uh, business. And I'm thinking, who, who are you? What, what do you think you're doing? Well, it turns out he owned the building. He owned the building, and Mr. H was only leasing it. Now, there were two of these guys. One of them owned the company that owned the building, and the other one 
was like an, an executive of this company. They were millionaires, if not multi-millionaires. They were part of this good old boy system that owned the land at the truck wash. And that whole group collectively, um, and I have no problem giving them this name. It isn't meant to be insulting. It's, it's, it is descriptive. It was a redneck mafia. And that's what I call them, is the redneck mafia. The question is, how could these guys own the building? And how could they interfere with our business like that and creep us out, or creep me out anyway? Jethro actually knew who they were. He just never bothered to tell me. But nobody introduced me to them. Nobody introduced them to me. I had to find out when I went to see who that stranger was, the bizarro who drove through our bay, where they don't belong anyway, and then they walk in the building and straight into a no-admittance area. Then I find out who they are. And that was after I'd worked there for maybe well, about three months. That's inexcusable. Again, no orientation, no explanation. Um, another thing that was a real red flag to me is when I asked Mr. H about this, then he finally told me, oh, well, I don't own the building. You know, so-and-so owns the building. And I lease it from them, and I pay the association fee to this good old boy group that, you know, nobody knows exactly what this association is or what it does. And I asked Mr. H at that time, I said, well, what do you get out of paying this fee? Because it was a huge fee. And he said, oh, well, nothing, but, you know, we have to pay it. And I was like, ho, ho, ho. What do you mean you don't, what do you, what, what is this association fee for? It's a huge amount of money. He said, well, I don't know. And I thought, okay, again, how not to do business. Mr. H leased this building from the Redneck Mafia. He pays an association fee or else, and he doesn't even know what it's for. He gets nothing out of it that's perceptible. Again, as I start learning all these things that I did not know at the beginning because there's no orientation, you can see the red flags. This is how not to run a business. But if you think that's bad, and I'm going to take a sip of coffee here because I'm losing my voice. It gets monumentally frustrating and just absolutely surreal, these red flags. Over time it became obvious, and I've, I've alluded to this already, Mr. H and his father just routinely interfered with the operations of the business. They interfered with it. Now, of course, they didn't see it that way. They weren't coming in there to interfere with it. But as someone who has been a part of world-class teams and competent businesses, it was so obvious, it, no one could deny it, that they were just interfering with the competent running of this business. They were interfering with revenues. In fact, um, you know, you'll find out later I did revenue tracking on my own initiative. Um, when they were there, our revenues were less than they should have been every time, or just about every single day, for various reasons. You know, for one thing, they didn't know what they were doing. They undercharged. They quoted wrong prices. Um, some of the drivers just couldn't stand being around them, so they would come in, see that they were there, and leave. So we lost that business. Um, and then, of course, Mr. H and his father would say, Why? Well, some of these drivers are really impatient. And they just never got it through their head that the problem is when they come in, you talk their heads off so that they can't even think straight, and most of what you say is a bunch of nonsense. You know, something you got out of a fortune cookie or or, you know, the History Channel or something. I mean, you're just, you're just rambling, t talking their heads off when they have a life to live, and they don't want to deal with it. But guess what? I didn't want to deal with it either as an employee, but I had to. It was an unwritten part of my job because there were no written procedures, there were no written job description. So this literally was a part of my job, servicing their egos and putting up with that kind of nonsense. Um... Let me see, I'm going to try this. Really got surreal. Um, Mr. H demanded mediocrity. Okay, he didn't want a... If, if we could get away with a terrible, terrible job, if we got away with it, no complaints, he didn't care. But I did an excellent job. I was the only one who did an excellent job. The drivers came to love me very, very quickly, and they wanted me to wash their, their um, trucks. In fact, on, on more than one occasion, I had drivers who, when I washed half a truck and Jethro washed the other half, or this other fellow who was there in the summer washed the other half, 
the driver would pull me aside and you know discreetly slip me a tip and say I want you to have this not those lazy beepers I won't even tell you what they called them but they were disgusted that only half their truck was coming out of there nice and they would deliberately give me a tip and say don't let the other guy have this they don't they didn't deserve it but yet I would get routinely not really reprimanded, but Mr. H did not like me doing that good of a job. It made the other guys look bad, and it, his goal was mediocrity, and you're going to find that. Now, how that's possible, look at everything else I've talked about Mr. H. He does not know what he's doing. His, he has a dream, he has a vision, and it's so detached from reality that he would even institutionalize mediocrity as the goal. For someone like me who's dealt with extraordinary... Uh, I love the extraordinary. I love accomplishment. I love um, uh, world-class teams, outstanding teamwork. This was just, you know, the equivalent of nails on a chalkboard to me. It was just made my daily life at this place a nightmare because he would not let me do a great job. It, was, it had to be mediocrity. Okay, so another thing. Mr. H was obsessed, and I mean this in the clinical sense, with the machine. And the machine was this huge, tall, steel structure that went over the tops of the trucks. And all it did was drop soap and then rinse. Uh, there was also an undercarriage wash at the beginning, which was really the only useful thing. But that wasn't part of the machine as such. It was part of the programming of the machine. The machine was this thing that would move over the tops of these huge trucks. Mr. H worked on the machine all the time. He's always working on the sensors. And his goal... And I had to learn this over several months. His goal literally was to have the machine do a consistently mediocre wash, but consistently. It would never do an extraordinary wash. It would never do a poor job, terribly poor job, but a mediocre wash every time. And then once he got that, he could, I don't know, I think he wants to franchise this out or something or build a whole bunch of these. That's his dream. Now, if you haven't already noticed, even if you're a business student, if you're a first year if you're a first day business student hopefully you understand the problem with that model already it's called competition okay if if your goal is to provide a mediocre service competition's going to rub you out now it's not to say that it isn't possible okay if your value is is fine but these are 100 dollar washes there's no value in that if you can believe it, at the beginning of um, November, in the daytime, it's actually kind of warm. So excuse me while I wipe some sweat off. I'm stuck in this car without the doors open. It's, um, and I had the heater on before I started. Um, but the point is, Mr. H is absolutely obsessed with the machine. And I mean, I mean obsessed. He, he will shut down the business to work on the machine. He will come in, um, he will, for example, frequently, I can't even count how many times, he would say he's coming in at 7 a.m. to work on the machine. We open at 9. He wouldn't show up until 8.30. So then he would keep, he'd start working on the machine and keep the place closed until 9.30, 10, 11. Once it was as late as 2 o'clock. Just arbitrarily shut down the, the most profitable side of our business where we wash trucks so that he can work on this machine. And here's the thing. In the 10 months that he owned that place, and I was there for about eight, seven, eight of those. At the end, the machine did nothing, not one thing that it didn't do when I first started there. And in fact, it worked worse. It was, it was less effective. The machine was a thorn in our side. Those big posts that held it up, we constantly injured ourselves on those, smacking into them. It ruined the access for us with the power washers to be able to access the truck properly. They had huge bolts in the, in the things that held up on that, and they would catch the hoses. They created safety hazards all over the place. The machine was, was just, it just got in our way. It really didn't do anything at all. That last rinse, yeah, that's nice to have. But if we washed a truck properly, it shouldn't have needed that. And what is so hard about creating just a stationary rinse as the driver leaves? Um, this obsession is the reason, more than probably anything else, that Mr. H did not attend to all of the other needs at that place. He had one other obsession as well I need to mention um, with security cameras. 
Okay, now this is not Fort Knox, and this is not loss prevention at Walmart. This is a truck wash. It's two big empty bays that you drive trucks into with hoses, an empty hallway, a basically empty um, lobby with just a TV, and really that's about it. And yet he was obsessed with security cameras, and you're going to find out why, and it's a pretty creepy reason. Um, he just wanted to, again, dominate and maintain control. I'll, I'll give a bit away here. I was sleeping at that place at his urging, and um, he, he, he once told me flat out, I've watched you sleep at 3 in the morning on those security cameras because he could view them from his home. And if you don't understand how creepy that is, even if I wasn't homeless and, and vulnerable and one of the things about homelessness is you have no privacy. You're just never alone. So wherever you go, someone else can enter that space because you don't have your own place. The idea that I could be there in the middle of the night in a truck wash sleeping and some guy 40 miles away is watching me on television like I'm a zoo animal or the Truman Show or something, that is really sick and twisted. And this is the kind of way that Mr. H operated. Hence, his second obsession was with security cameras. Um, but I'll talk more about how I came to actually sleep there um, in the video about Mr. H. Overall, I learned over time Mr. H had just plain a troubled personality. He was a troubled individual, and he, he had terrible social skills, um, epic arrogance. I've, uh, rarely have I seen anything like that. Um, there were ethical problems emanating from this, which I don't like. I'm a very, I, I, I'm a very moral person. I do my best. Not to say I haven't made mistakes, but that means a lot to me. That goes back to Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, um, the organizations I've been a, a part of all my life, church and everything. It is. It doesn't just drill morality into me. I see the reason for morality. I see why it's a good thing, and therefore I wish to maintain it. Lots of ethical problems here at this truck wash. Um, he was totally unreliable. I've already told you a lot of these things. He, he wouldn't fix things properly. He couldn't even do payroll reliably, which is ultimately the reason people are working there is to get their pay. Um, he was very manipulative, very. And that created a special problem for me because I have studied um, rhetoric and propaganda and manipulative language um, mainly as it applies to junk science the way that junk science has been politicized since the late 80s in particular. Um, but I have about 30 years experience studying details. Uh, I mean, you know, the fundamental linguistic manipulation that allows rhetoric and propaganda to spread deceit and lies. And he just used these tactics expecting me to not understand what he was doing. And I understood every single thing he was doing. And it just, again, it's just like fingernails on a chalkboard for me. I couldn't get away because I'm homeless. I needed that job. And for him to be using these tactics and to expect them to work on me, and then he would get upset when they didn't work on me because I am competent, because I've studied these all my life. They didn't work on me. And that would just frustrate him, and then he would become more or less abusive with his language and with his tricks. And I'm not going to sit here and try to figure out how much of that was conscious or unconscious. When you look at how overbearing his father was, you can see where a lot of it came from. It isn't the point. The point is, I don't go into work to be abused. I don't go into work to be manipulated. And if I am in a workplace and in some bizarre situation where the owner urges me to sleep inside the, the store, hiding behind the counter all night so the police don't mess with me, which is what happened in this case, if I'm in such a desperate situation that I end up doing that and sleeping there. I don't want some guy watching me sleep in the middle of the night. I don't want to feel like I have to be compelled to be on call 24 hours a day, which is what happened. Again, this was basically indentured servitude, human slavery, somewhere in that realm. And it's because he urged me to sleep there, and when I did, all of a sudden, um, you know, he boasted very much of his charity. He called it charity. How, look how much I'm helping Paul. You know, I let him sleep there. I gave him this job when, you know, with no background check or whatever. You know, he would say all these things. He would boast all the time about how charitable he was. But what he actually did, the way he exploited me there, had the opposite effect. And I'm now far worse off than I was before I started there. Um, 
if only because at that time Minnesota winter was ending. Right now, Minnesota winter is beginning. Um, now, my notes have, are a little jumpy here. I just I had to get these things in somewhere. I didn't know which video to put them in. I've talked about this employee who came in in the summertime. He came in right before um, July, right about July 1st, plus or minus a week. He said from the beginning, I'm leaving at the end of September. He was moving to another state where he had another gig. He was going to become a, a manager of a business there. And he, um, you know, he gave plenty of notice. What is that, three, four months notice that he's going to leave? Well, when the day finally came that he left, right when he said he would, Mr. H still had not even begun to hire a replacement. He hadn't placed an ad, hadn't done anything. And by that time, we had drummed up so much more business, having been open all that time, that Jethro and I ended up working just, again, like I mentioned before, for two weeks straight, we basically worked without any breaks or lunch, unless we just demanded it. We would have to do things like go shut the doors and tell the drivers, sorry, but you're going to have to sit in the parking lot for a half hour while we take a break. And we're locking the doors so you don't come in and bother us. I mean, that's no way to run a business. No way to run a business. And then, when Mr. H actually did um, put an ad on Craigslist for this truck wash, it was a very deceptive ad. It contradicted pretty much every experience I had there. And in the end, he ended up hiring the first person who came in. And um, that person worked for one week, and they missed their second week because they were in jail. But guess what? People like that are vulnerable. They need a job badly. So Mr. H kept them. Again, he likes to have employees who he can dominate and control and exploit who are vulnerable. And... For me, that was a bad thing because my vulnerability is entirely external. It's not because I'm incompetent, with all due respect to Jethro and these other people. I'm perfectly competent. I am in a situation, uh, a systemic problem in society that I can't get out of. And Mr. H just obliterated my chance of getting out of it when it should have been my ticket out of it. Um, let's see. Well, I told you before the painters arrived that one day. The painters were, what happened was this redneck mafia who owns the building, a little nepotism went on there, and they, they're, you know, some brother-in-law's friend or something like that, hired these painters, didn't really bother to tell Mr. H, the guy who owned the business, that, oh, we're going to shut down your business for two weeks while we paint. Now, the painters were totally incompetent. They were, they were just a joke. So it ended up being five weeks. And when the five weeks was over... Um, the very day after the painting, after we reopened from painting, I realized that the paint was done wrong in every respect. The floor was slippery. It didn't have sand in the paint, and it didn't look like very thick paint on the floor. The paint on the walls had already in one day sucked up so much dirt and grease and grime that I could not wash out that it looked worse than before they painted at all. And before that, it might have been 10 years since they painted Something was seriously wrong with this. So I called up Mr. H and I told him these things. But this is where this is where you get a sense of Mr. H's personality. He didn't want to hear it. He said, well, you must not be washing the walls properly. Again, very insulting, very belittling. Um, I'm quite capable of washing a wall. Yeah. And um, then he said, well, you must have really slippery shoes. You know, you need better shoes. Well... Again, these were new shoes that I had, and in fact, a week later, a member of the Redneck Mafia who owns the building, he came in, and he almost slipped and fell on that, and the first thing he said when he looked down there is, there's no sand in this paint. This is exactly what I told Mr. H. Now, Mr. H didn't listen to me, and this blew up two months later when Mr. H finally had to come to terms with the fact that what I had said was true all along. And then, all of a sudden, he's racing around, running around, scrambling to get this fixed. And guess what? When I left this business last week, they were getting ready to shut down for two weeks to repaint that bay. The last time they did that, it ended up being five weeks. Now, throughout those five weeks, Mr. H's response, he had just hired a third person right before they shut down the most profitable part of the business. How not to do business. 
So now instead of two employees who needed something to do, he had three employees who needed something to do. So what did he do? He cut our hours, all of us. So now three people were making half as much money as before for five weeks, and we didn't know when it was going to end until it finally ended. How do you manage your finances that way? That one shutdown and Mr. H's response with no compensation to us for this unexpected shutdown that we had no notice about, that's what obliterated my plan to get out of there. I was supposed to leave in October, leave the state of Minnesota, have enough to get an apartment in another state. From then on, it's smooth sailing. I can get a job very easily once I have an apartment and hygiene. It hurt Jethro very badly. He was always living on the edge anyway. It hurt this third guy who came in for the summer. He could no longer afford to move to this other state to this job that he had all ready for him. He had to borrow money in order to do that. And, in fact, it hurt Mr. H because he lost about half his revenues for five weeks. This is something that the Redneck Mafia just imposed upon him because they own the building. And you have to ask the question, if they own the building and he's leasing it for a business, how can how can they possibly tell him we're going to shut down your business for X number of days or weeks and he has nothing to say about it? So we'll look at that more when you get into these relationships and contracts and such, but um, it seemed pretty obvious to me that one of these guys was a silent partner who was telling Mr. H what to do, even though Mr. H strutted his stuff around the place. I'm in charge, I'm the boss, I'm the big cheese, the top dog, you know, what I say goes. Um, it, this is the total utter chaos of this place. It's inexcusable. Can you imagine if you go and lease a building to start up your own small business and you operate for about six months and then the owner of the building says, well, we're going to tear everything apart and you won't be actually be able to make any money for two weeks. And then at the end of the two weeks, every day for the next three weeks, they keep bumping it ahead and you never know when it's going to end. And finally, mercifully, after five weeks, they're done and you can reopen again. Something is really, really wrong there. Um, that's how not to do business at every level of it, including the Redneck Mafia. That was one of the most just sleazy business moves I've ever seen in my life. Even if they did have the ability to, if they had a silent partnership and they could tell Mr. H what to do, that was just sleazy because they really ruined the lives of three employees there and they hurt Mr. H badly by costing him all that revenue. Um, but here's the thing, it just gets even more absurd. I keep telling you how surreal this was. When I asked Mr. H and I said, well, they should have a clause in the contract with the painters that says if you're not done in two weeks, as you said you would, they pay a penalty, right? And he said, oh, no, no, no. It's a contractor's market. Uh, I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, they're building the Viking Stadium. All the contractors have so much work, they don't know what to do with it. They call the shots. We can't put a clause like that in a contract. They won't take it. And, and I'm thinking, like, um, first things first. If, if these painters had anything to do with the Viking football stadium, then the stadium's in peril of collapsing because these guys were Larry, Moe, and Curly on some drug that no one's ever heard of before. These guys were terrible painters. Look what they did to ours. They used the wrong paint, for heaven's sakes. They did it completely wrong. Second of all, not every contractor in the state of Minnesota is working on the stadium. That was just a dumb answer. That was ludicrous. And for him to try to pawn that off on me is very insulting for someone like me who has worked enough in business to know better. Basically, he didn't know enough about business, and this redneck mafia didn't know enough about business, even though they have millions of dollars, to put a clause in the contract getting penalties from the painters if they shut down this business for weeks beyond when they promised they would be done. Inexcusable. How not to run a business. Um, there were, I mentioned before about ethical dilemmas. The, the number of ethical dilemmas here was just, they just kept building and building and building, and that was one of the biggest problems I had. It's one of the things that drove me to, um, you know, kind of lose control of myself there. I just do not like being forced into ethical dilemmas that I cannot get out of. And the only reason I couldn't get out of it is because I live in a car. 
If I had had a home, I could leave it and go get another job the next day. But I didn't have a home, so I had no choice. For example, um, I mentioned before Mr. H's demand for mediocrity. To me, that is unethical. Drivers are paying a lot of money. Um, some of these washes were well over $100 just for a wash. And some of these guys with the show trucks, they would come in every week. That's $100 a week for all year just to wash your truck. For them to get anything less than a great wash is, in my opinion, unethical. Especially when we could do a great job if the boss would let us. Or when they leave and one side of the truck has a great job and the other side has a mediocre job. Because I did a great job and Jethro, following instructions from Mr. H, did a mediocre job. Inexcusable. Um, and of course we took a lot of heat from drivers for that too, so we took a lot of abuse directly from drivers who never really understood that the boss was telling us to do this. Um, Jethro too, though, did, did a lot of unethical things. One time we ran out of the brightener that we used to brighten the metal, you know, those the metal rims on the tires and the gas tanks and things. And again, because Mr. H didn't keep up monitoring supplies, we would run out. Well, in this case, we had already they rang it up before the before the um, uh, before the services were provided which I thought was the wrong thing to do at this place so they had charged them a lot of money for this service well we get out there and we wash the truck and when we're done with that we find out oh we don't have any more of this brightener and Jethro went around and pretended to spray with this empty bottle and then rinsed off nothing and then he brought it over to me and told me to do the same thing he said just pretend you're spraying it because he already paid for it and I can't, I can't tell you just how sick to my stomach that made me. But these kinds of things happen all the time. Jethro and the other guy who were there, who was there in the summer. And by the way, this other guy who came in for the summer, he also worked with Jethro with the previous owner. So at that point, you had two employees who had worked for a failed truck wash. That's what Mr. H brought in. And he gave them more of a benefit of the doubt than me, with all my business experience, because they had more experience with a truck wash. But again, as I mentioned a moment ago, by my first or second day, I was already washing trucks better than anyone else. Mr. H did not know how to evaluate you know, who was more credible among his employees. He just couldn't do it. And here's a perfect example. Jethro and this other guy for the summer had what they would call an, basically an a-hole charge. So if a driver came in and they looked at Jethro funny or they honked their horn and tried to summon us to come to them instead of coming to us, or if they did anything, let's say they tried to pull in and they had trouble so they had to keep backing up and everything until they finally got it straight so they could pull in without hitting our building and that would upset Jethro. He would, well, what an idiot, this guy doesn't know how to drive. Well they would attach an a-hole charge so when they went to wash out the trailer they would add five bucks and call it a disposal fee even though the trailer was empty didn't need it and I just found that reprehensible Mr. H also routinely lied and I'm talking about like mostly little white lies and deceptions things like that cover-ups but he did it all the time and it was in fact meant to cover up his total incompetence or something unethical we had done or the fact that we were routinely doing mediocre to bad washes. Worse, he instructed me specifically to do the same thing. He said, well, here's how you handle that. You just, you know, tell the driver that, you know, such and such happened, this, this machinery broke or whatever, even though the machinery hadn't broken. Instead of telling him, well, we just did a crappy job. Let me make it up to you. Let me fix this. Instead of doing that, tell them that the machinery broke while we were doing the wash or something like that. And this happened all the time. I was instructed to lie, and I just despise that. That is how not to do business. I want people to rely on what I say as being truthful to the best of my knowledge and my ability to communicate it. How can I do that when I'm told by my boss to be anything other than truthful? Um... Now, along these lines, Mr. H in particular, for all his inability to communicate and all his rotten social skills, if I brought up the issues of ethics and morality in particular, he had a, like a visceral reaction to it. He would just, 
you could almost see him switch and try to quickly think of, uh, and he would change subjects. He didn't even want to talk about it. He would not talk about ethics or morality. And I've seen this before in big corporations from people who are unethical. Um, it's basically trying to seek plausible deniability. He knows exactly what's going on there. But if I ever mention it to him, then all of a sudden he's on the hook for it. If I never do, then he can say, well, I didn't know that was going on. Because, again, he, he lies, so why not just lie again and say, well, I didn't know this was going on. It, it just made me sick to my stomach working at this place. Overall, I've given you a big picture here, a big, big broad brush, how this truck wash operated. If you look at all these red flags here, I mean, this is more red flags than ever existed in the Soviet Union. And this is just in a little truck wash. Like I said, if I had had any freedom, if I had not been kind of sucked into this indentured servitude mode because I literally couldn't go anywhere else and I was so close to death, I had to have these paychecks, which sometimes actually showed up on time, most of the time didn't. If it hadn't been that situation, I would have been gone. Sayonara, see you later, Mr. H. Good luck. I'm going somewhere where I can take some pride in my work and where people appreciate what I'm able to do, that I'm into excellence and extraordinary accomplishment. Mr. H was not into that. And that made my life at this place a living hell. But I guess the only, I'm not going to say it's something good that came out of it, but it's something um, productive or useful that came out of it, is that for a business to make, to do every single thing that could be done wrong, I mean, they really, uh, this business really did nothing right. I, I, I can list out what they did wrong in every department. Accounts, um, environmental health and safety, security. I mean, there isn't a department in a, in a corporation I can mention that they did not do things wrong. But if I'm trying to think of what they did right, I can't really come up with anything. So that's, that's not a good thing. I'm not going to sit there saying, well, I'm sure glad I went through this, so now I have this experience. But the fact is, it taught me something I hadn't learned from my competent mentors and the world-class teams I've worked for in the past. It taught me how not to do business. And the fact that someone's even allowed to do business this, this way, especially with all these ethical and safety issues, is just shocking to me. Um... But, you know, when you're in that kind of good old boy system at this truck stop area, they protect each other. And as long as they don't go and piss off the legislature in St. Paul or someone in Washington, they're really going to be left alone to keep doing that indefinitely. Of course, this business is going to fail. And if you don't already recognize that this business is going to fail unless something, some kind, something miraculous is injected into it, this business is going to fail. Period. The, the employees are going to lose their jobs. The redneck mafia is going to have, they're going to lose a lease. They're going to have to deal with that. Mr. H is going to lose what was, I thought, something that was supposed to help make his family be well-fed and well-clothed and well-housed. All those truckers who depend on us, because the, the nearest competition are miles away, 30 miles away, uh, 70 miles away, 200 miles away. These truckers really depend on us. They're going to get hurt when this place fails. And it didn't have to be that way. So what these videos are going to be about on how not to do business is doing a, an autopsy, some kind of post-mortem on each of these cases that I've just given you a broad overview about. So in the next video, which is part three of the introduction, I'm going to talk about Mr. H in detail. Because as the owner of a business that nominally had only two employees, the buck stops with him. If the place is failing, it's because of him. And he's, he came right out and said it. He made no bones about it. I'm the owner. I'm in charge. What I say goes. I'm the top dog, the big cheese. It's me. Now, he never said the buck stops here because he did everything he could to push blame and accountability onto other people. But when it came to exercising authority, he made no bones about it. I'm the man. Now, of course, it turns out he's not. The Redneck Mafia apparently tells him what to do. But my point is that I have to do an entire video just on Mr. H to communicate how his personality and character and psychological issues were predestined to destroy this business. There was no way this business could ever succeed 
because of him. And if you encounter people like this in business, whether you're leasing a building from them, or you partner up with them, or you get in some kind of legal um, association with them, perhaps with trademarks or patents or something like that, or you end up working for someone like this, or you end up working alongside someone like this with any possibility that one day they might rise up and be promoted above you. If any of that happens with someone with this personality type and this character type, you've got a red flag the size of the moon. Run, run, run as if your life depends upon it. That is how not to do business. So that's why I'm going to talk at length about Mr. H. It isn't about me wanting to bust his chops or get back at him. I'm so anxious to forget that he even existed, I can't tell you. But it's so fundamentally relevant to this series on how not to do business, I'm going to have to tell you more about him in the next video. So I hope you'll come back for that video. Um, I'll try to do it when it isn't at noontime. How it can be hot in early November when I'm freezing at night, I don't even understand. I'm very hot in this shirt. Um, so I'll try to be a little more comfortable and a little less sweaty in the next video. Um, if Please do subscribe to this channel, and if you like this video and the topic, please like it there. And again, one of the reasons I'm doing this is to try to get some help, some donations, tips in the tip jar, or job offers, or other suggestions to help um, so that I don't have to live in this car anymore. Because I think you're already seeing, just from the first two introductions here, the only competent person at this truck wash was me, the guy who lives in a car. And there's something fundamentally unfair and unjust and just inhumane about that. And that's one of the points I want to make. So I look forward to having you back for part three, and I'll let you go now. Thank you so much for watching.